Hello, friends and furies. My name is TV Sky. And um, I was a little... I, this is a QA video. I, I put up the call on my Discord channel, uh, or my Discord server, which has like 2,000 members at this point, and asked people to just send me any question that they wanted, then I'd make a video and talk about it. I picked out 50 questions, which we're going to answer in this video, but before we do that, um, the reason we're doing a QA video is because I was a little bit at a loss um, for what to talk about today. Not because there's not stuff to talk about. There's plenty of stuff. I, ha I have a whole list of topics that I could talk about, but I was I was doing the laundry today. I, I've, I've been putting... I've had a bad week for my brain. I've had depression brain for a while. What that means is I don't get stuff done. Like, I've I've had... I've like got a bunch of dishes have been piling up. My apartment looks like crap right now because I haven't been cleaning it. I've been pulling myself back out of that, and part of that process is doing my laundry, and so I was I was doing the laundry, and I was putting it into the dryer and stuff, and I was just kind of waiting for, for like, a, a washing cycle to, f to finish up, and so I pulled out my phone, because I remembered somebody sent me a, a message on Patreon. They needed to ask a question about a commission and stuff, so, okay, go fix that, reply to the message on, on Patreon, blah, 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 and then I looked at, at my Patreon page, and I saw that that I have 155 patrons, and I don't know. I knew I had that. Like, it's not that that number was news to me because I do follow along. But there was just at that moment in time, there was just something about that that kind of got into my head somehow. Like 150, 155. How? <laughs> That's who the hell has 155 people who just want to help them make stuff and and who 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 gives them money to do, like it's so that 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 kind of knocked me out and all of the I had all these other topics that but really honestly what I just wanted to do today was talk to you guys somehow and I I figured like the best the best way to do that was was to, was to do like a Q&A &A video and the the best place I I had to kind of get questions was 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 the Discord server where like a lot of my patrons are all on the Discord pretty much uh, Discord pretty much because th that's part of the rewards anyway. Uh, so I took some a bunch of questions and 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 we're gonna be answering them now. But I just I I don't know why I've 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 spent a long time making creative work and putting it online and a long time of not really making any money and, and not really having an audience and not having people pay attention. Like, I've been doing creative work on the internet for like 16 years at this point, like in some form or another. And I used to suck at it, obviously. Like, <laughs> 16 years ago, I was very, very bad at everything. And, and it's taken a lot of practice to get here, but it's just, it's still, I, I'm now in a position where and it's not like uh, Patreon isn't completely stable because there's always declines on cards and there's always like uh, stuff that happens month to month. And YouTube is certainly not stable because like if if I have a month where the videos don't do so well, then all of a sudden like a third of my income from YouTube can just kind of disappear. But I, I make enough across my revenue streams now that I can I, uh, I can pretty much do this for a living like YouTube and, and my creative work and stuff. And that's me so long to get here um and it's really weird to be here and the only reason i can do this at all is because i'm lucky enough to have you my audience not just the people who support them like everybody who subscribes to the channel everybody who's who's i see when i upload a new video sometimes people post comments like notification squad and they're excited to be the first people to watch one of my videos, and that's... Because from my perspective, still, I'm just a guy talking about stuff that interests him and his nerdy self-interests. And people being excited to be the f like to be the first to be first in line to... Re hey, holy shit, I, I made it early. I'm excited to be one of the first people who see this. Even if it's just a little bit, that's still... <sighs> That's a hell of a feeling, I'll tell you what. <laughs> anyway, I just... I f today I felt like it was kind of important to to say thank you out loud. Because... Um, I mean, I want to do that every day, but that, that would be boring and be tiresome. And after a while, I feel like you wouldn't believe me anymore. But just, just for today, just please indulge me and let me just say... Thanks for 
letting me do this, like for letting me get away with this somehow. I don't know how the hell I'm getting away with, but but I'm very happy that I do. Anyway, questions. I had selected 50 questions from the from the Discord server, and believe you me, I had to leave out a lot of them. So, the first question comes from Don't Hate the Dot TV question, and that's the hashtag air quotes that I used on the Discord so I could search them out and find them. What's the worst job you've ever had? The worst job I ever had was telemarketing. Well, it wasn't technically telemarketing. Tel- technically, I was a pollster. Like, I, 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 I called people on the phone, and I asked them polling questions about various things, but effectively, and this is the reason why the job was fucking awful, we were telemarketers because the questions that we were asking would often come in from like corporate clients and they would phrase their questions in such a way that I was essentially delivering advertising to the people whose time I was fucking wasting by calling them up about any things. And the worst one I remember doing was one for Miracle Whip. And they were doing what was ostensibly was like a customer survey kind of thing. But what was actually going on was I would call people up and I'd say, oh, here is a brief questionnaire. It's an opinion poll. It'll only take about 10 minutes. And then I would spend at least 25 minutes. I was I had to say 10 minutes. That was the job. But I would spend at least 25 minutes asking them a question that went somewhere along the lines of this. Do you agree that Miracle Whip can be used in irregular cooking as well as sandwich making? Have you ever used Miracle Whip brand products in your... like? And it was just mentioning the name of the product over and over and over again and mentioning to people that, hey, you can use it in cooking. Hey, you can use it on sandwiches. Hey, you can use it for this. You can use it for that. You can use. It was not about collecting information. It was about repeating the name of the product over and over and over again to the people who just who stuck on the line. And it was. Yeah, I felt so miserable stealing people's time, like like lying to. Like the job was to lie to them essentially. And the worst ones because like the the people who tended to stay on the line tended to be old people, especially lonely, like people who just really just wanted someone to talk to, and you could always tell. And it was heartbreaking and it hurt. And I lasted for six months because I needed the money, and then I was I was out of it. It gave me depression. Like it really, my depression went into a raging overdrive because of that job. I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. I would never ever do it again if I could avoid it. Like oh god, I would rather pave roads, like clean toilets, anything. Next question, God King Sky, and what is your favorite song? It depends. Like if if I'm in a good mood, I have certain favorite songs, and if I'm if 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 I'm in a bad mood, it's others. But the one that's been in my head now a lot is Vampires by the Midnight from their album Endless Summer, which is just a brilliant piece of retro wave music that I recommend you check out. I'm going to put a link to it down in the description. It's on YouTube. Go check that out. Imagine Cocky Birds asks, that's a good name, thoughts on male sexualization in video games or lack thereof? Good lord, yes, and I'll probably save those for a separate video. But the thing I'll note here is that there's a difference between something being sexy and something being sexualized. Being sexy is just an attribute that a, that a thing has in the mind of a particular beholder, but being sexualized is a active decision on behalf of the media. Like, a character being sexualized requires active effort on behalf of the designer who designs the character. It requires... A character being sexualized by a film requires active effort on behalf of the director and the camera person. It's... Like, it's the difference between um, Pool Party Fiora, for example, who was a splash art that was in that video about sexualization, is not a particularly sexualized character. Like, she's a sexy character who happens to, to be there, but in, in and of herself, she's not sexualized. But Evelyn, on the other hand, her splash art is sexualized. And the difference is that Fiora's splash art isn't about her breasts. It's not about her wearing, like, uh, hot pants or whatever the heck it is that she's wearing. It's about her whacking men over the head with the pool noodle, and she happens to be sexy while doing that, but it's not quite the same thing. Evelyn's splash art is about being sexualized because it's about her sexual attributes. It's about her sexual availability. It's about her sexual seductiveness, right? And it can be a difficult thing to parse. I agree with that. And it, it often it's, a, it's an act of interpretation, which means that there isn't one universal objective answer to the question of whether something is sexualized. But that's something I really should have pointed out in, in, in the video so that people would be less confused in my comments. Set Arc asks, have you given a try on Warframe? If so, any thoughts about their organic designs? Yes, I have tried Warframe. I could download it. I played through like the, the opening tutorial level and just kind of took a look at it. I haven't really dived too deep into it, but there is like there is some interesting stuff going on with the organic designs. Warframe in general, the aesthetics seem to be very busy, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but they also seem to be quite well distinct. Like I don't feel like I get visually confused when looking at Warframe, which is always the risk when you have something that's highly detailed and busy. There's some interesting influences from like uh, Aliens 
style, like H.R. Giger, who we talked about in the What's the Deal with Alien video. Like, there's an interesting influence from that as uh, that fusion of the organic and 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 the technological. But I haven't quite worked out a full set of thoughts on it. If I ever do, I'll make a video about it. Brute asks, favorite characters in My Hero Academia? Yes, but the absolute top of the line is Froppy. Suyu is the best girl. End of story. You can't argue with me, don't at me. Rakai asks, how would you introduce lore into the actual gameplay of League of Legends? Do you prefer to do so through events or specific game modes? Yes. I think League of Legends was right to take the lore out of the main action of the game. Like, normal games in League of Legends now are not canonical in any way. They're just, we're taking all the characters from our stories and we're letting you toss them at each other for fun. And it has nothing to do with the lore of the game itself. And I think that's the right call, because if, ultimately the whole Summoner's Institute of War thing became limiting. And it's the same approach Overwatch is taking. So I think uh, game mode, specific game modes, like for instance, uh, what they're doing with the, what they did with the Star Guardians game mode and the, and the Project game mode, those are really good models for how you could explore story content in a single player fashion, which is something that uh, Overwatch has already done with like the Uprising mode. I thought was a really, really good way to let players explore the lore of Overwatch by essentially having it be a PvE mode. And I think ultimately they're going to have to rely on single player PvE modes if they want to deliver a consistent a specific narrative because if you have people in competition with each other then you can't tell one consistent story so I think PvE modes that are kind of like limited and come across every once in a while would be a good way to deliver lore in League of Legends Delta K asks what do you think about LOL having so many different art styles do you think it hurts it by not having a unified and much more immediately recognizable one League of Legends does have a unified and immediately recognizable aesthetic or at least all the recent splash arts and all the updated splash arts do have a rather a pretty consistent unified aesthetic it's, it's kind of hard to describe because it is somewhat generic but it is I mean I can recognize a League of Legends splash when I see one one of the one of the new ones but I think League of Legends has a strength in having an extremely diverse group of, of genres that it works with like we have Graves and Twisted Fate who are essentially sort of a revenge western type story we have Biltwater which does pirate stories when we have Demacia which is sort of really high fantasy kingdom sort of in collaboration with with the Noxus we have the, the Freljord which is like Viking fantasy writ large and stuff like that with Shurima which is like ancient Egyptian stuff all of that is is tied together fairly cohesively within the League of Legends universe. And by having all of those different art styles, all of those different thematics to pull from, League becomes a much more interesting game than if everything was unified into a cohesive set of themes, which is why I think it's also very clever that Riot have been un unifying their lore into factions, like specifically making the lore much more about each individual faction having internal stories than having stories between the factions specifically. Spooky asks, what are some other projects past or present you've worked on outside of YouTube? Oh, good. I mean, too many to count. Like I've I've run six or seven web comics at this point, and like most of them are not online anymore, so you can't find them because I will not let you. They're terrible, and I don't want you to look at them. But like outside of of, of the YouTube and stuff that people might not know, I, did, I used to do a lot of Castro comics, which was a series of comics primarily focused around the esports side of League of Legends, but also like occasionally uh, dipping into other games and a lot about the shoutcasters who worked on those games. That was kind of the thing that first got me into esports and first built me a bit of an audience, which I then eventually translated into the YouTube thing. You can find that at castercomics.com. There's a link to that down in the description. I've also done a Star Guardians fan webcomic, which has a, a, a few chapters available right now you can go and read, and I, that actually has a separate Patreon, but that's, I've, I've not had time to work on it for a very long time now. I still am developing it, but it's just, with everything else that's happening, I haven't I haven't had a lot of time to do it. I've also done like a bunch of animations. Um, I've done some commercial animations for a few ads that I don't really know if they're floating around still. I've done some uh, animation for uh, the League of Legends podcast, The Dive, and uh, for an older podcast that was uh, hosted in Europe called uh, Backchat, and I've, I've done all kinds of stuff. Leo asks, what's your favorite nation faction in League of Legends in terms of champion design, lore, etc.? Piltover and Sawn are my favorite faction. I really I really do dig the whole having sort of the, the, the Piltover as this shining city on the hill, upper class, sort of technological wonderland with this tremendous dark side of sort of repressed, you know, working class people sort of suffering in chemical swamps and like this, this very, very strong class conflict divide thematic that's going on there. I think that's really, really good in terms of storytelling. I think it's really really strong. You can tell a lot of good stories there. So that's my favorite. Snowy Silverly asks, do you like Fire Emblem or any other games? No, I hate all other games. I hate them. I hate them. And I've never liked them. I'm of course kidding. I love Fire Emblem. I'm very, very fond of that series. And as soon as uh, the new one comes out for Switch, you can I promise you I'm going to try and see if I can't do some videos about that. I might need to buy myself a capture card, though. 
CYN Swift asks, are your pets rats? If so, why did you decide to get them? It's not just a pet that I get to see every day. Well, uh, yeah, they are rats. Uh, we've got four of them. One of them died recently. We used to have five. Uh, and I, we decided to get them because basically we don't have a big apartment. We're not really allowed to keep cats and dogs and stuff. And we didn't want hamsters. And we have we have a friend who kept rats. So we decided to, to give that a try as well because they are, they are relatively cheap to keep. Like they're relatively easy pets to deal with and they will eat pretty much anything. Although so you should definitely look carefully into the kind of nutrition that you get them. It's just, they're lovely. I love my rats a lot. Cyrilif asks, How long do you generally spend thinking about the end sequence in which we are always advised not to touch the dislike button? Or do you just wing it? Like, occasionally I come up with the idea for the dislike button story before I do the video, but mostly I forget to do that, and then I get to the end of the video and I'm like, holy shit, I need, a, I need a story about the dislike button. Think, man, think. And I just have to kind of blurt out the first thing that comes to mind and, and, and try and improvise my way around that. And I'm honestly surprised that people like them as much as they do. Cinnabon asks, is there anything you wish you did sooner in life? Yes and no. I mean, there's a lot of stuff where I feel like if I started earlier, I could be so much further along by now. But the thing is, I wasn't ready earlier. Like, it, when I look back on my life, every single time is like, yeah, yeah, I could have started sooner, but I wasn't ready and it wouldn't have worked. So, yes and no. Mr. Baboy6 asks, Do you think there is a type of character diversity that Overwatch needs? What kind of new character would you like to see fill that gap? I would like to see a rogue AI character in Overwatch. That is not, not an Omnic, not necessarily a robot character, but a character who is a rogue AI, who like takes over different robot bodies and uses those to fight. Because a lot of the Overwatch lore revolves around this conflict with the Omnics that was caused by rogue AIs just kind of taking over a bunch of robots and going wild and trying to destroy the world, essentially. And I'd like a character who could kind of do a little bit of work in, ter in terms of exploring the kind of psychology that those AI intelligences have. Demon Boo asks, are you going to do a collab with Necrit anytime soon? I would love to see one soon because I love both your guys content. I don't know. Are we Necrit? Hit me up, dude. Um, uh, do, do you want to do a thing? I want to do a thing. Let's do a thing. SM Grubbin asks, how do I grow a beard as majestic as yours? Y you don't because my beard is not majestic. It's scruffy. I have always been scruffy. I have never had a full beard in my life. If you want to see a truly majestic beard, go look at Scarzard. Modrak Mio asks, after your What's the Deal with Alien, do you plan on doing other... Yes, yes, I get this question a lot in a lot of different forms. Do I want to do a What's the Deal about this or that or the other thing? And yes, to all of them. I want to. I want to do videos about all of the things, but I don't really have time to do more than one video a day at most. And that's sometimes kind of exhausting. So right now, I'm mostly focusing on League of Legends. Probably going to mix in some Overwatch every once in a while. Hopefully, as once Smash comes out, maybe I'll do something about that. I don't know. I want to, though. Pro X Riptide asks, what would be your take on a merchant type of champion for League of Legends? They tried to do that with Orn. I think that's really the execution that League of Legends designers went with for that kind of character is because they it's a very, very difficult thing to balance. But the thing I would be interested in is a character who uses gold as their resource, like who, who pays money to cast spells and who has all kinds of ways to gain more money than any other character in the game. But in order to be effective in combat, they have to have a certain amount of money on hand. And so the thing you have to balance is okay, do I use all this money I have to buy items and then I can't actually use any of my abilities in combat because I don't have enough money or do I save up my money so that I can use my abilities and you kind of have to balance that. That to me would be very interesting. That would be how I would do it. But I'm really not a game designer, so... Well, okay, here's a name. Space Cocaine asks, where would you like to see League of Legends and perhaps Overwatch universe go in terms of story direction, meaning overarching plot? I don't think League of Legends should have an overarching plot. Like, I don't, I think Riot have done the right thing by focusing on factions specifically. And for Overwatch, it's kind of the same thing. I don't think there should be like an overarching universe-wide plot that's going forward. I would much more like to see League of Legends and Overwatch going the direction of um, traditional superhero comics, essentially. Like where you have individual characters who have storylines and sort of individual groups of characters who have storylines and you know maybe each faction in the game can have storylines but you're not doing like a whole universe wide thing because that's what World of Warcraft is doing and at this point I I don't know how people can still be invested in averting the apocalypse and, and Blizzard seems to agree because they've tried to make the stakes much more personal in the new expansion as far as I can see so I would like to see them kind of splinter and not do an overarching plot. Jones asks, if you're ever coming to Finland, you should consider coming to Sukma. I've considered going to Sukma. Like, Sukma is really nice this time of year, but I've got some friends who live in Lekma. So if I'm ever going to Finland, that's probably going to be where I'm staying. 
GG Freak asks, do you still watch the Overlord anime? And if so, what's your opinion on season two and three? That's a whole video that I could do. And in fact, I probably will do a video about Overlord sometime soon. But my general opinion on Overlord is that I love it a lot. Like, I, it's just a concept that I'm really in love with. I love the way that it's executed. I do feel like sometimes it spends a little bit too much time just kind of doing extemporaneous stuff. But I've read some of the light novels and they do the same thing. So it's kind of hard to fault it for that. But I would see, like to see it pick up the pace just a little bit. Okan asks, are you even actively playing the games you talk about? like League, Overwatch, or WoW, or are you just interested in the design aspect of the characters? Yeah, pretty much. Like, I haven't played a game of League in at least nine months, probably longer at this point. Now, I used to play League of Legends very actively. Like, I played very actively season two, three, four, I think even season five, but at this point, I haven't played in a very long time because I've really become much more interested in League of Legends as an IP than League of Legends as a gameplay experience, which is why I don't generally talk a lot about gameplay on the channel at all. And it's the same thing for a game like Overwatch. I'm much more interested in Overwatch as an IP, as a franchise, as a series of stories than I am in the FPS gameplay experience. But I have, I did play a lot of the um, Uprising game mode that Overwatch came up with, and I would love to play the Star Guardians mode. I missed that one last time around on League of Legends. I'm going to play that one next time it comes around. But generally, no, I am much more of a design nerd than I am into the gameplay. Sleven asks, and by the way, Sleven is currently my top supporter on Patreon and I, I honestly feel unworthy of it, but thank you so much. I want a special shout out to you, seriously. They ask, how do you go about analyzing a work of art? What is your process? I wish I could give you a more satisfying answer than the answer I'm going to have to give you, but the ultimate answer is I don't really understand that process myself. It's For me, it's, it's, it's both an intellectual and an emotional process to figure out how I feel about a work of art. Like I, I look at it. I consider it, I, th I sit down and then I try to think about it from all of the angles that I have available to me. Like all of the ways of criticizing a piece of art that I know, I try to apply them, all of them. And I, and I try to come up with ideas and I try to think about like, like what does this mean to me? What does this, what does this uh, cause in me? If I apply this critical lens to it, does that tell me something interesting about it? If I apply that one, does that tell me something interesting about it? And I talk to myself about it. Usually I talk out loud. I'll, I'll come up with an idea, I'll say it out loud. And then my brain will go, wait a minute, that sounds stupid when you say it out loud let's rephrase that let's come up with that and it's just it's just it's just a process like, i don't know specifically what the process is but i think that's about the best answer i can give you leona katoflmos asks do you ever get used to rats biting you i have never been bitten by any of our rats like that's that's never happened like i generally as long as you don't scare them don't back them into a corner and you you try to stay calm and careful and and feed them lots of snacks. They'll they'll be nice. Like sometimes they explore things with their teeth. Like they'll they'll nibble at your fingertips or they'll nibble at your toes or something like that just to kind of because they're figuring out what what it is and how they feel about it, but I've never been bitten. Ayer asks, does it ever get tiring to make the same kind of content and do you want to start working on other things or does analyzing League of Legends in the style you work with satisfy your creative process? Pretty much, yeah, to both of like It does get tiring to do the same kind of content, so I try to do other things and I've got other projects on the side. This is something that you don't necessarily see on the YouTube channel, but I've got other hobbies. Like, <laughs> I've got other shit I do, other creative outlets that I use that don't necessarily go on YouTube, but they help me kind of uh, keep things varied. And right now, I'm very happy mostly analyzing League of Legends, but also occasionally other video games. Like, that's... I'm satisfied with that. The moment I'm not satisfied with it anymore, I'm gonna move on to other things instantly. Rose Elysium asks, have you ever considered making videos talking about character design in anime? Yes. In fact, I'm probably gonna uh, in, in, in the near future. I, I would love to talk about Hero Academia. I would also love to talk about Overlord. And I want to talk about One Punch Man because there's some really interesting stuff going on there. And I wouldn't mind talking about superheroes, either like traditional Western superheroes. But again, I only have so much time in a day. I can only do about one video a day. And right now I have my hands full with the League. So maybe it'll happen soon. Maybe it won't. I can't make any promises. Fox Crusade asks, what kinds of characters does League need to diversify? Well, I've talked about that a little bit already in other videos, but a fat lady would be nice, an old crone or a witch of some kind would be nice. Those are archetypes that I feel like it's a little bit weird that League of Legends doesn't already have. And it would also just be nice to have a casually LGBT character, of some, like some kind of casually queer character. Like a character who is queer in the same way that Saya and Rakan are straight. In the same way, like Garen has these voice lines where he flirts with Katarina, but it's not like he walks around going, I'm super straight about everything all the time. He's just, he has some voice lines where he flirts with Katarina because Katarina is a pretty girl. I'd like that for a queer character who's just, who's just, who happens to be queer and has some flirty voice lines with the person of like the same gender or whatever, but it's otherwise not a huge production. It's not a huge thing. It's just they're queer and they're here and we're fine with it. Rose Elysium asks, 
Do you have any tips on pricing commissions fairly? How does an artist know what their art is worth? This is hard. Like I've, I've been a freelancer for a very long time. It's hard. Pricing stuff is hard. Getting a fair wage for your work is hard because some people can't afford to pay very much, but you want their business anyway. Like so I, I've definitely done a lot of commissions like for icons and things that I've learned to produce really quickly where I charge way less than I really should because I just want to get a lot of them out there so that people see them so that they work as advertising. There's always some tension there, but as a baseline, like if, if you don't have any other factors influencing you, at the very least charge minimum wage for your time. Like if a piece takes five hours, then charge five five hours worth of minimum wage at least and preferably more than that because art is a highly specialized skill. It's a highly specialized craft. It's a thing that's difficult to learn. It takes a lot of time. Like being a doctor, like being a carpenter, like having any specialized skill, you should be able to charge more for that. Real life is complicated. It's hard. But as a baseline, start with minimum wage and then go up. Don't, please, if you can at all, don't ever go below. Rakai asks, what's your secret kink? Oh, Sweet child, none of my kinks are secret. Spectre asks, who do you main in Smash and why? I main Link because I'm boring and bad at Smash. And now we have a whole bunch of questions about the subject of you know working as a freelance artist, getting into freelance art, getting into drawing and stuff like that. So strap yourselves in. Janked Artist asks, How long have you been drawing and what inspired you to draw? I've been drawing for at least 17 years, probably longer, and the thing that inspired me to draw was Dragon Ball. Like, the Dragon Ball manga got published in Denmark, that was the first time I'd ever seen manga, and I got completely fucking blown away by the artwork in it. I picked up a shitty How to Draw Manga book, which was terrible, it taught me some terrible habits that it's taken me a long time to unlearn, but it got me started, and that's what inspired me and got me going. Then GG Freak asks, Did you have any education in illustration or design, or are you self-taught? And if you were self-taught, do you have any advice for how to get into the freelance business? I have no education whatsoever. Like, I've taken classes, lots of classes. I've taken life drawing classes. I've taken croquis classes. I've done workshops with people and stuff like that. But no, I don't have any formal education. I am almost entirely self-taught. And as for how to get into the freelance business, I can't give you a roadmap because there isn't one. Like, every freelancer I know has a slightly different story. The only thing that's universal across all freelancers is you have to do a lot of work for a long time for little to absolutely no pay. Like, in in the same way that when you're a doctor, you have to do a whole lot of internships and, and, and you have to do a lot of clinic time and stuff like that where you really aren't paid. It's part of your education. Artwork is kind of like that. You have to do a lot of time just building up your skills, building up your portfolio, building up a skill set, building up an audience. That shit takes a long time. And then eventually, maybe you can get to do this stuff for money. And it sucks that it happens that way. But as far as I know, that's what it is. The most important thing you can get, though, the absolutely most important thing is to build a network of peers, to get in touch with other artists, get in touch with other people who work as freelancers, who work there, and build a positive relationship with them. A relationship where you help them, they help you, you all help each other out, you give each other commissions every once in a while, you give each other feedback. But mutually beneficial, not parasitical, mutually beneficial relationships. That's the thing that will sustain you as an artist more than anything else, is to have that network of peers. Phantom Party asks, what's it like being a freelance artist? And what was it like before YouTube? And what's different now that you have a YouTube channel? YouTube hasn't changed anything for me in terms of being a freelance artist, really, except that I have less time to be a freelance artist because this is more steady and frankly better paid work most of the time, which is considering how little money YouTube really does make, that's telling you something. And being a freelance artist is stressful. It's stressful, it's hard, it's it's um it it takes a long time to do, it has a terrible return on investment. I had a lot of anxiety about it and I don't recommend it really to anyone um if you would rather be a doctor or a teacher or anything else. Sanic the Het Horg who is frankly a very good artist, actually. I've seen some of the stuff they post on my Discord. They're really good. How does one get started as a freelancer? And where can I go to get myself out there so that potential partners can find me? Again, network of peers. That's the first place you need to be because peers will share information with each other. They'll tell each other about opportunities. They'll they'll let people, like if you post your commission information online, your peers will retweet it and share it because they're in the same boat. So long as you share their information as well. How do you get, you, do you get yourself out there? Well, it's a whole, like you have to make, do work and post it online, especially get into a fandom. Like, if there's some show or a thing you're a real big fan of and it's has an audience, produce a lot of work for that audience, do a lot of fan art so people see your work and go, oh, hey, that guy's pretty good, and then maybe you can get them interested in your original work. If you're interested in comics, you can submit to various comics anthologies. I know Iron Circus does anthologies pretty regularly, and they take submissions, and also lots of little indie presses all around the uh, country, all around the world, really, take submissions every once in a while for anthologies and, and for publishing of various kinds. I recommend against doing free work for no return whatsoever, but if, if you have a comic already and someone's willing 
willing to publish it, that can be a way to do it. Made Lucifer asks, how did you manage to become a freelancer and deal with the anxiety? Many around here don't even consider opening commissions because of this little monster. Yeah, I wonder that myself as well, but <laughs> honestly, the answer is I became a freelancer because it was the only thing I could do. It's the only job that I can't be anything but a creative person. I, I can't do anything else for a living. I can't, I'm not, I don't have the mental fortitude to do any other kind of job. And that's really the only circumstance under which I recommend that you become a professional creative. It, it has to be because you can't do anything else. This is my only option. This, being creative on the internet, doing freelance work, building up customer, it's the only thing I can do. It's the only thing I'm emotionally capable of handling in the end. And that's how I'm able to overcome my anxieties because everything else would be worse for me. <laughs> This is a terrible idea financially. It doesn't give you a good return on investment. It's not stable. It doesn't let you save up for the future. It's hard to pay down your student loans when you're a freelancer. If you have no other thing that you, your heart, your emotions, your dreams will let you do, then you can pursue this. Under all other circumstances, I hate to say it, but I can't recommend it because it, it's hard. Leona Katroflomos asks, how does the higher cost of living in Denmark affect your international freelance work? Do you have to work more to make ends meet? Do you raise prices and does it make it hard to find work, etc.? Yes to all of those, really. Like, the higher cost of living in Denmark has been troublesome. Fortunately, I have pretty cheap living arrangements right now because I have a roommate. By the way, I recommend getting a roommate someone to share the rent costs with. Maybe you can, you know, share the cost of food every once in a while. That's extremely helpful. But yes, I have, I do have to charge more than a lot of my peers who live under cheaper conditions or in cheaper countries. Um, but on the other hand, I have free healthcare. I got free tuition for school for <laughs> fucking almost 18 years. I get, I I've, I've, can get a lot of subsidies on dental work and stuff like that. So there's a lot of stuff that I don't have to worry about that my peers, especially my American peers, they do have to save up for healthcare expenses. They do have to save up for like a, a sudden unexpected trip to the dentist. They do have to save up for those things that I don't really have to worry about. So it's, it's, I, I prefer living in Denmark and being a freelancer. I really, really do. And IT Valg asks, why did you start doing what you do? And here's where uh, I want to return to that one because this is hard to talk about because I'm privileged. Like that's, Let's just start there. I have 155 people supporting me on Patreon. I don't know why I deserve that, but but I, I have them and I'm grateful for it, but I'm, I'm lucky. I'm extremely lucky to be in this position. And so it's hard to complain. <laughs> <laughs> about that. It's it's hard if if I ever say something negative about my situation, that sounds profoundly ungrateful because 155 people are giving me money to do this shit, right? So how could I possibly complain? But here's the thing. If I could trade all of my creativity right now for a brain that doesn't have depression and anxiety, I would. If, if if I could trade my creativity for the ability to hold down a nine to five job, like a normal be an be an accountant or have some kind of stable existence where I don't have to freak out every month about holy shit is, is my armor payments gonna come in on time and is this commissioner gonna pay and if I could trade it, I would. This is not. Everyone has a hard life. Lots of people have much much harder lives than I do. I don't want this to be. The trouble is like. We romanticize creativity. We think, oh, the creative, yes, I am the creative master genius connected to the creativity of the gods. I am a different creature. I am above you. I am better than you. And that, and we have this image of, of, oh, it would be so great to be a YouTuber full time. It would be so great if I could just be an artist full time. It would be so much easier. It would be so much nicer. And yeah, I'm, I'm profoundly privileged to have the life I have right now. I'm so fucking lucky. I can't believe it. But I would trade it for if for just a stable, just be a dentist or, or anything, office worker. If I could not have this brain that tries to, you know, make me miserable sometimes, I I would trade it. I don't recommend this life. I I really don't. It's, it's the only thing I can do, and I'm very happy doing it, and I'm very lucky doing it. I love doing this, but I don't recommend that anyone else do this unless, like me, they have to. Because it's not... In a lot of ways, it's not a good idea. Let me put it... It's hard to talk... I'm sorry. I mean, I am sorry, because it, it is ungrateful to talk this way, but I feel like I have to be honest that if I could trade this for a normal, stable life without mental illness, without 
instability without without the anxiety of not knowing where my next paycheck is necessarily going to come from i would maybe in 10 years i'll feel different but right no right now no anyway i'm, I'm sorry for the bummer let's move on sp majir 23 asks what's your opinion on piracy like torrenting a movie etc i think the first principle we have to operate on is pay artists for their work always Pay people for their work. Always, always pay people for their work. Anytime it's at all possible to pay people for their work, you should do it. That's the first principle we have to operate on. I also think that a lot of the history of film got lost because nobody bothered to make copies of the original. There's Nosferatu, one of the first vampire films ever created, a seminal work of film history, was only preserved because people made illegal copies of it, because the original rights holders didn't care. They let the original master tapes decay. And the same thing has happened to music. A lot of the time, lots of old masters of, of great artists, before they entered their prime, have been lost because nobody thought to preserve them, and they're only preserved through bootleg copies of their work. I also think that a lot of gaming history has gotten lost because rights holders have gone out of business and haven't preserved their source code or they've thrown stuff away or in some cases like the the NES Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle games there are multiple rights holders spread out across multiple companies who would all have to get together in order to reissue the game to make it available for purchase for a modern audience and so so much of the history of art becomes inaccessible to us because it's under ownership of companies and corporations who will not release that work to the public unless they can profit of it. And sometimes they can't profit of it, and then what incentive do they have to preserve it or care about it? The fine art market have this, has the same problem, by the way. Lots of rich people are using fine art as an investment, which means they purchase paintings and artwork and they store it away in climate-controlled warehouses where nobody ever gets to see it. And they change hands and they trade in them and they speculate in them, but the artwork is never displayed to the public. It never goes out and helps form culture. And I think the current state of copyright law is a time bomb. I, th I think it's a time bomb. I think it's a poison in culture that's going to come home to roost in some terrible, terrible ways. I think the Disney Corporation's m monopolistic takeover of, of pop culture in general, of worldwide pop culture, with all the shit that they're starting to own, with all the companies that they're absorbing, is terrifying. And I think there are worse crimes than downloading the ROM for an old video game that you can't buy anymore anyway. Glitchy Gear has a rather long and involved question that I'm going to have to summarize quite substantially here. When people go out of their way to not sexualize a character usually female, they can go straight for the opposite extreme and make an intentionally ugly character. Any specific notes on designing female characters who aren't sexualized? Yeah, get out more. Half of the world's population are women. If you want to know something about the full diversity and the full range of ways in which women and femininity and femaleness and, and various aspects of that version of a visual aesthetic can be expressed, go out into the world. They're out there, the ladies, dressing in all kinds of different ways. Some of them like to be sexual, some of them don't. Some of them dress skimpy, some of them dress like nuns, some of them are nuns, some of them aren't. It's the full range of the human experience is out there and available. And the only thing I wish that just pretty much everybody in video games would do more is go out there, get out of the headspace of making stuff for video games and start making stuff from life. Hitmonkey, where did you learn to sing? You're actually pretty good. Well, uh, thank you very much. I didn't learn to sing. I mean, I learned to sing in my bedroom, annoying my family for years and years and years by being very bad at singing until eventually I got sort of kind of good at singing. Practice. It's, it's always the only answer. Zen asks, how would you define art? I wouldn't. Schmivian asks, how do you feel about Tumblr? Not the drama that happened, but the community. I think Tumblr is a social media platform. And like all social media platforms, when we talk about it in the normal discourse, we are not actually talking about the actual thing itself. We're talking about the cultural idea of the thing. When we talk about Tumblr, we talk about a cultural idea of what Tumblr is like. When we talk about Reddit, we're talking about a cultural idea of what Reddit is like. When we talk about 4chan, it's the same thing. When we talk about LiveJournal, back in the day, it was the same thing. When we talked about MySpace in the back in the day, it was the same thing. Nowadays, when we talk about Facebook, it's the same thing. We're not actually talking about the thing itself. We're talking talking about our cultural understanding of the thing. And I feel very differently about the website than I do about the cultural understanding. I think the cultural understanding is weird and kind of stupid and I don't want to engage with it. I think the website itself is a perfectly useful social media platform that I enjoy using. Tomo asks, how's life going? <laughs> Surprisingly well, actually. 
Dognip asks, if you could personally alter one champion's lore with no limits, who would it be? Well, I would alter Kaiser's lore, and I would alter her lore to say that she was an internationally renowned supermodel, one of the sexiest people on the entire planet, until one day she accidentally got trapped in a cursed void bodysuit that made her look incredibly sexy, but also gave her void superpowers, because that way her lore would actually match her character design. Kushina asks, how did you learn to do what you do? Analysis, art, etc. Self-study. I'm, I'm self-taught. I just, I'm just curious about things. I've read a lot of stuff. And like I said earlier, when I analyze art, I'm, I'm, I'm referring back to everything I know about pretty much everything else I've ever read. So it's read broadly, read lots of stuff, expose yourself to many different perspectives, many different ideas, and then, then, you know, start to form what you believe yourself and, and, Get a hold of as many tools as possible to use to do the thing that you want to do. That's how I did it. Soul Step asks, Do you think that Piltover's Sawn versus Noxus storyline hinted at in the Progress Day color story in the Darius comic will happen at some point? And if so, what might you want to see from it? Hey, I'm still... Like, Riot has been doing a lot better on the lore front recently, but after so many years of them releasing stuff and never following up on it and releasing stuff and never following up on it and releasing stuff and never following up on it, I'm not optimistic that it's going to happen within the next decade. <laughs> maybe, maybe, but it's also entirely possible that the thing that's going to happen is what's happened before is that some other part of the universe like before they can get circled back around to the thing they started they're going to have changed so many other parts of the universe so substantially that the old thing doesn't work anymore and then they have to reboot their way out of it and the cycle begins anew if it does happen though i would love to see some personal conflicts between champions from the various regions i would love to see what happens when katarina infiltrates son in order to get a hold of some forbidden chemtech technology and runs into i don't know victor or echo or something like they make the characters and champions interact with each other that's the thing i want Lockon asks, do you think you'll ever include how a champion or really any video game character's design ties into their gameplay? Sort of, maybe. I, I'm, I'm, sometimes I really do consider going in and like taking a detailed look at their kit and talking about how ex it expresses their character. But then on the other hand, I'm also like not that interested in it because what happens in the game of League of Legends and what happens in the game of Overwatch doesn't really affect the lore. Like the things they do on the Rift are canonically non-canonical they don't really matter so i'm kind of stumped on that one really like maybe i will one day but mostly it just feels like it's not been that relevant to me I, I should take i should look more at their animation though like that's something i should really do more of mayfield asks do you plan on continuing dark souls i personally can't wait for you to get to the later areas of the series as the character design of the bosses is amazing imo yes i am continuing it i get this question a lot because it takes me a long time to produce those episodes they i'm i'm not fast at editing that stuff i need to do the gameplay then i need to do the editing then i need to do you know pull my thoughts together and do the post segment it takes a long time I'm slow at it. It's coming. I'm working on it. I promise. Don't worry. IT Valk asks, am I allowed to ask this question? No! Gormless Cretan asks, do you play any musical instruments and or sing casually or professionally? Well, I Google you late at night when I don't know what to do. And I find photos you've forgotten you were in Put up by your friends I Google you When the day is done and everything is through read your journal that you kept that month in France I've watched you dance and I'm pleased your name is practically unique it's only you and I would be PhD in Chesapeake who writes papers on the structure of the sun I've read each one I know I should let you fade But there's that 
that box and there's your name somehow it never makes the pain grow less or fade or disappear i think that i should save my soul i should crawl back in my hole but it's too easy just to fold and type your name again i fear I Google you Whenever I'm alone and feeling blue And each scrap of information that I gather Says you found somebody new I know it really shouldn't matter I ought to blow up my computer But instead I Google you